Okay, sorry for that. Um, where were we? Um, when we have decided upon a conceptual and an operational definition of what we are trying to measure on the phenomenon, we just still have to decide on the measurement scale. And why is that important? Because depending on what scale um, we use to measure a phenomenon, um, there are different things that we can do statistically uh, with us, with the with the data we get. Okay, and um, we have this these four distinctions. First, we have this, uh, the so-called nominal scale. Um, when we have data that is uh, nominally scaled, um, well, those are just pure categories. Okay, and they with with these kind of data, you can just tell whether something equals something or not. Okay, so maybe something like hair color, sex, or a phone number. Those are just categories. Um, that is very abstract, but imagine an Excel sheet where um, we have like different persons in, in, in the rows and the first variable is hair color. Okay, and here we could say this person has black hair, this person has red hair, this person is, has black hair, and so on and so on. And for each person we can say, we can tell what the hair color is. Um, and it, it, it's a pure naming of a category. Okay, and um, statistically what can we do with these kind of data? We can count them, that's basically all we can do. Okay, we can count them. We can count how many people in this whole data set have black hair, okay? That's basically all the statistics we can do with purely nominal data. Then the next scale is, co is called the uh, ordinal scale. And if we have data that is scaled ordinally, um, basically we can do the same things with, uh, as with uh, nominal, nominally scaled but additionally there is some kind of ranking in those data, okay? Um, basically, um, let's say the, the persons that are in this, um, in this, uh, in this data set um, participated in some kind of race, okay? And um, we have a, a we have a ranking of uh, who got first. Let's say this person was uh, first, this one was second, this guy was third, and this one was fourth. Okay, assuming there's no one in here uh, in between. And um, this is an example for an ordinarily for ordinarily scaled data. Okay, we can count how many people were first: one, two, three, four. Okay, so we have one for each. Um, but we can also ra um, bring this this uh, column into an order, okay? So um, in Excel, you could just click on it and sort the data and you would have a ranking, okay? Um, what, 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 is, what can we do with this? Um, Basically, well, the, the, the ranking is all we can do with it, okay? We can say who was first, who was second, who was third, but in this in this these kind of data, we cannot tell um, what the, how much faster was the first person than the, than the second person. And uh, is this distance equal uh, between second and third, okay? Um, Basically, we can only do a ranking, but we cannot uh, t we cannot say anything about the differences between the, the ranks. Okay. Um, one uh, one interesting example for ordinarily scaled data is uh, school grades. Okay, grades are also ordinarily scaled. Let's say. Um, we're looking at some test grade. Okay, 
this kind of information does not tell us anything about the difference between um, A and B. It just tells us that, well, this guy had a better grade than this guy, okay, and this guy. And the two two ones with a B had a better grade than the the one per, the person with a C, but we it doesn't tell us anything about the differences, okay? So uh, when we have ordinal data, what can we do? We can do everything that we can do with the nominally scaled data. So we can count. We can count how many people had an A, how many people had a B, how many had a C, and additionally we can ca calculate the so-called median, okay? We can tell, we can set, we can calculate which grade of those is just in the middle. That's the median. Then, thirdly, we have in, inter, interval scaled uh, data. Let's uh, create some room. Um, interval scaled data, uh, um, well, they encompass ordinal data, so you can do everything you can also do with ordinal data. So you can count, you can uh, calculate the median, but additionally, the difference with interval scaled data is that um, in addition to the rank, we can also, we also have some information concerning the differences between ranks, okay? and um, well, the difference between ranks is always set the same for interval scaled data. And the standard example for in, an interval scaled data is uh, the so-called IQ test. And the way an IQ test is um, constructed is that the difference between two persons with a score of 130 30 and 120 is the same as the difference between a person with a score of 50 and another person with a score of uh, 60 okay this difference and this difference of 10 is this is constructed to be the same as the difference between these two okay and when we have uh, interval scale data we can um, use um, a wide variety of statistics. We can use, uh, we can calculate the mean, we can calculate standard deviations, we can calculate correlations, um, but uh, we cannot do everything. Um, or um, these are not the most flexible data because additionally, uh, there is the so-called ratio scale. With ratio scale data, um, there is an abs there is per definition an absolute uh, minimum okay so an example would be blood pressure um, absolute temperature or uh, age or any kind of uh, measurement for length okay all of these I have mentioned they have an absolute minimum like probably zero okay um, and what is the advantage over interval scale data? We can say that um, if we have someone who is, we, ha we have a person who is uh, one meter tall and another person who is two meters tall, we can say that the second person is twice as tall, okay? And this kind of statement is only possible if there is a, 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 an absolute minimum, okay? Um, Yeah, but other than that, um, interval and ratio scale data are very similar. Um, with uh, with regard to what we could do with them in statistics, and oftentimes they are um, mentioned in one breath, and we call them metric scales. Okay. So an example in our table would be, uh, okay, size, this guy is 180 centimeters, this guy is 175, this one is 210, and this guy is 165, okay? This would be 
metric data and well to be more precise ratio scaled data um, the differences are always uh, the same so um, let's change this to 170 so the difference between these two persons 180 and 175 that this difference of five centimeters is the same as the difference between this guy with 175 and this guy with 170. Okay, um, so metric scale is always in also encompasses ordinally and normally scaled. Okay, it's also a, a category we could count how many people in this data set um, have size 180. Okay, it's a ranking because we can bring this into a, a, a an a rank a ranking we can sort this by size um, yeah and it's interval scale because the differences are always the same and it's also ratio scaled because there's an absolute minimum and zero okay you cannot be minus 10 centimeters tall it's not possible okay interesting So that much about scales. Uh, this is all very standard. Okay, you can read up on this on anywhere online. Now, before we can uh, go on with uh, a scientific and empirical study, we have to um, decide on the quality of measurement. We have to well consider quality of measurement, and two very important criteria to um, determine whether a measurement is uh, of high quality or not um, are reliability and val validity. First, reliability. Reliability describes whether a measure is able to measure the same thing repeatedly. Okay, If we measure something repeatedly, do we get the same results over and over again? Okay, And if that is the case, it is, we, we have a reliable measure. If it's not the case, we do, it's an unreliable measure. Okay. So the focus here is on consistency and reproducibility. Um, because, well, consider if someone, if someone conducts a scientific study and um, publishes their results and um, someone else tries to reproduce these results with uh, the, a similar design and they get r different results then it, it, it might be a problem of reliability okay so how do we how do we determine whether a measure is reliable or not well um, consider the example consider the example of a bathroom scale um, well imagine uh, you you uh, you put yourself on the scale three times within the same minute and um, if uh, what the scale tells you is different each time then probably it's not a reliable scale okay and more scientifically you could take 50 persons of different weights and you could um, You could tell each of those 50 persons to um, walk onto the scale t um, two times, and you could write down um, you could write down what the scale tells you, and the data set uh, should be perfectly correlated or very highly correlated. And if if that is so, then we have good reliability. Okay. So that that might be kind of a nonsensical example, but, um, well, it's not always that easy, right? With a bathroom scale, you would expect a perfect reliability, but um, it, it's that's not always the case, it, it, for example, uh, especially in social sciences, okay? Um, so consider an experiment and uh, some some variable x that we are trying to measure at uh, some p 
point one and later on we try to measure the same thing okay at point two and we have four persons and let's say measurement is something like this and at this at the second point in time we receive somewhat of a me something like this okay a measurement like this then you can see okay this is not perfectly the same but um, it's very highly correlated right um, it's very similar and of and this the overall structure is the same so this would still be a highly reliable measure okay x1 and x2 would be reliable measures of some um, construct okay but um reliability is one important criterion but, it, but it's only a necessary condition for a good measurement it's not sufficient by itself why is that so um well <clears throat> imagine imagine you would uh, you are trying to measure intelligence with a bathroom scale okay um with a a, a good bathroom scale okay so um you walk onto it once, walk onto it twice, you walk onto it three times. It always tells you the same thing, so it's reliable, but it does not tell you anything about your intelligence. So um, that is our second criterion. It's called validity, and validity is about whether we are measuring what we actually want to measure. Okay. Um, of course, we cannot measure intelligence with a bathroom scale, and um, one important thing about validity is that uh, validity of some scale can never be higher than reliability. Why is that so? Um, well, imagine the bathroom scale uh, was not reliable. Okay, if it uh, every time you step on it, um, it gives you a different, uh, a strongly re different result. <coughs> so we have low reliability. If the results are never the same, we we can also never know whether we are actually measuring what we want to measure. Okay, so validity can never be higher than rel reliability. Okay, now assume that our that our scientist has uh, found an operational definition. We have found a reliable and valid scale of measurement for uh, the phenomenon that we're interested in. And then what we do, what do we do? Well, we collect our data. And uh, when we're done with that, we receive a data set. Okay, and as I said, a data set, you can typically think of as an Excel sheet. Okay, usually, uh, it's something like this ID, we have several persons in this data set, some variable, another variable, and so on, and so on, okay? And here we have different values, okay? That's how you can think of the final data set. Okay, dots might not have any good idea. Okay, so um, now that we have our data, what do we do? Of course, we do statistics. And um, basically there are two things we can do with uh, statistics, very broadly speaking. Um, first, we can um, do what is called descriptive statistics. Um, this is basically just to enable us to describe the data, okay? Um, okay, going back to my example. Let's say this is our data set. Okay, so 
let's say this is our example data set. Um, just by looking at it, we can already identify some properties, right? We can say, we, we can already see, okay, this, this measurement um, is kind of around 80 or 9, uh, well, on average around 80. This measurement is lower, but we have an outlier, and so on and so on. We can describe data, and descriptive statistics basically help us, um, they help us describe the data, okay? We can calculate a mean for this variable, x, um, x, I don't know what this is called in English, a mean, an average, we can call, calculate an average for this, um, or we could um, calculate a standard deviation, and so on and so on. Basically, this is about describing the data set, okay, with um, summarizing um, statistics. Um, but this is purely descriptive statistics because, it, well, it only describes the data, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't provide any actual analysis of the data, okay? And that is what we do with the second method, which is called inferential statistics. This branch of statistics allows us to draw conclusions from the data, okay? Um, for example, we can um, calculate correlation, the correlation between uh, these two variables. We could calculate whether um, they are moving in the same direction, whether they are moving pa in parallel, um, and so on and so on. And well, basically, we try to conclude something from the data. Okay, imagine X was some um, policy and Y is some outcome measure um, that we want to change using the, using the policy, then we could determine whether um, X actually has any effect on Y. Okay, we want to know if we introduce measure X, how does this change our outcome Y? Okay, and well, that is a great part of what we will be doing in um, regression analysis. A few more general things. Um, very important, sample versus population. Um, usually, we can, uh, we can never um, collect data on, well, we can never com collect the complete data on a phenomenon, okay? So usually we have to draw a sample. <coughs> uh, one example where we can um, collect all of the data would be uh, census data. When we um, ask all of the population in a country, but you know that this is done very seldom and it's uh, associated with a high cost, okay? So usually we have to draw a sample, okay? Um, imagine you want to you want to determine the quality of the quality of your ground of your of the earth in your garden. You cannot you cannot you cannot um, you cannot dig up all the earth in your garden and uh, measure the, its quality. Okay, usually. You would uh, go somewhere in the middle, draw a sample of the Earth, uh, take some of the Earth, and um, measure that Earth's quality. And from that, you would in you would draw a conclusion regarding the whole of the garden. Okay, the, the whole of the garden would be your population, and that is basically how we usually pr proceed. Okay, y we draw a sample from the population, and given some assumptions, we can usually um, draw a conclusion concerning the population. And uh, as you can imagine, it is important to be clear about um, how to draw the sample. Okay, and before we can even draw the sample, we have to be clear about the unit of unit of observation. A unit of observation means at what level of aggregation do we observe a phenomenon. Okay, um, let's say we are interested in unemployment. We can measure unemployment at the national level. We have an unemployment rate. We can measure unemployment at the state level. Okay, we can measure unemployment at the city level, maybe even 
lower. Okay, we can even measure unemployment at the individual level. For each person, we can determine whether that person is employed or not. Okay, and this is about the unit of observation, and uh, of course, the unit of observation should be driven by uh, our research question. Okay, if if our hypothesis um, is concerned with individual decisions, we should try to measure at the individual level. Okay, if our hypothesis makes predictions regarding uh, national level unemployment, we should try use national level data. Um, different levels of aggregation could also be um, firms, okay? A firm level would be uh, a unit of observation, or industry level could be a unit of observation. And as I said, the phenomenon, the phenomenon that we're interested in and our research design, well, they determine which unit of observation um, is, um, is best for our research. Okay, some, there might be some problems uh, regarding sampling. Um, <clears throat> and one of the imp most important problems is so-called selection bias. Um, what is it that we want to achieve with a good sample? Well, a sample that we draw from the population, should, uh, a sample should be representative, right? If the sample that we draw from the whole population is representative, then any trends, any systematic trends that we can observe in, within the sample should also be true for the whole population. Um, and if that is not the case, um, it's, it can be explained by so-called selection bias. Okay, And, uh, well, easiest way to describe, to define selection bias is um, by looking at some examples. Sorry. The sun was in my face. So still in my face. <laughs> okay. Let's uh, look at the first example. Um, let's say we want to uh, explain um, behavior and opinions of criminals and in order to do so, we would draw um, some random sample of criminals that are in prison. Okay. What is the problem with this uh, sample? Of course, we are only looking at criminals that are in prison. Um, and, well, it could be that uh, those who are in prison are only the stupid ones, because the clever ones are not in prison. Uh, so we do not have a representative sample of criminals. Okay, so drawing a sample from the prison would be a biased sample. Um, second example, uh, let's say you are a medical doctor and you are observing that um, that almost all patients that uh, are delivered into hospital with a certain disease usually die of that disease. Okay, and you could conclude that. Um, well, this is a very dangerous disease because almost all people die when they come into a hospital. But, of course, that is not a representative sample because um, you only get to see the people uh, where the disease has progressed in a way um, that they have to be um, brought into hospital. Okay, You don't know anything about the people who have that disease and who, who do not have to come into hospital. Okay, so that is not a representative sample, it's a selection bias. Um, third example, we can skip. Um, fourth example, um, imagine you are interested in knowing um, the average, into uh, asking for the average income of alumni of your university, and um, <coughs> imagine uh, you are sending out anonymous uh, questionnaires to all alumni of a certain year and you're asking for their current yearly uh, average income okay and um, well 
if you find out that uh, the, the average income of Uni Kassel alumni is um, astonishingly high, it doesn't really mean that the average income is that high. It um, th There might be several reasons why this is biased. Okay, One reason might be that um, some people might not um, might not uh, might not tell their income because they they might and, and those people who do not uh, give any information on their income might be those who have a lower income okay and that would result in a higher average income in the sample so we might have a section bias here and one important aspect of sample size um, uh, one important aspect of uh, of sampling is uh, sampling size. Um, of course, generally speaking, larger samples are better than smaller samples, and um, the larger the sample is, the 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 more precise the results should be uh, that we uh, c conclude from the the sample. But of course, the larger the sample, the higher the costs of the research become. Okay, um, and that is a basic trade-off concerning the sample size. Okay, we always trade off cost and precision, and we have to find some middle ground, of course, because uh, academic resources are only limited. And um, Let's assume, uh, let's assume uh, we have a somewhat large sample. Then our researcher can um, calculate average values of some variable, and um, also how uh, another uh, another um, measure would be a standard error of standard deviation of a variable, which tells us how much one variable uh, varies within uh, the data set, and um, Um, based on the data we collect in our sample and based on the statistics we compute in our sample, we can try to draw conclusions regarding the population. Okay, uh, And basically the population is, is reality. Okay, Because we are looking at an empirical phenomenon and um, Concerning this empirical phenomenon, the population that we usually cannot measure as a whole is the relevant reality. Okay, um, so basically, with our sample, we are trying to draw conclusions regarding the population, and um, whenever we uh, draw conclusions regarding the population, um, we are computing so-called confidence intervals confidence intervals okay and um, we, we, we will be looking at that um, in more detail later but basically confidence inter intervals tell us how precise a measure is okay and and, and um, how likely it is that what we have computed in the sample is also true in the population okay And um, well, before we can dive into causality, we have to um, define types of variables um, in the social sciences. Usually, um, for the most part, we are interested in causal relationships. Okay, we want to know if we do X, how does that affect Y? Okay, so we are interested in the causal effect from x on y okay so there is a clear direction of causality that we want to know okay in this case we would call um, the variable that is the cause x we would call that variable the independent variable and a synonym for that would be an explanatory variable because it it, it is the one that explains something else or we would call it right-hand side 
Oh, okay. So that is bad. Um, because it's on the left side in my drawing. Why is it a right hand side variable? Because usually we, we have something like uh, this. Okay. Y is some function of x. Okay. And what, when we change x, it has an effect on y. That is how we usually write it down, and that is why it is the right hand why x is the right hand side variable. Okay? Now on the other hand, y we call the dependent variable because it depends on what happens with x. Okay? And that is also why we a synonym for this is the explained variable, because it is explained by x or also left hand left hand side variable. Okay? Those these, that's the most basic um, types of variables, but of course, um, if you think about it, um, usually um, anything that happens in society is more complex than just um, is more complex than just x and y, right? Um, this is the most the easiest to analyze, but usually you have other factors, okay? And um, sometimes you can have a third variable. Let's circle these. Sometimes you can have a third variable that is in somehow, in some way related um, to this relationships. So this relationship and one example would be um, in reality we have this relationship x has an effect on, on z on z and z influences y okay but um, imagine that we don't know about z or we cannot measure z then this would lead us to conclude that x influences y, okay? Because we see there is a correlation between x and y, and um, if we cannot, if we cannot, or if we do not control for z, then this would be um, a false conclusion, okay? Because it's not really there; it's it's only a so-called uh, spurious correlation because the actual causality runs this way via z, okay? And um, these variables we call um, confounder variables, okay? And a similar type of variable is called intervening variable when, um, well, we know about z, okay? Um, we know about z and we know there is a direct effect uh, from x to y, but there's also an indirect effect via z, okay? Changing x leads to a direct effect on y, but it also has an indirect effect on y because it changes z and z changes y, okay? Um, well, and the important part is that um, when we when there is when when we think that there might be third factors that are relevant, we always have to include include them. Okay. If we do not include them, um, the conclusions we draw are um, false, are incorrect, they are biased. Okay. Um, let's look at some examples. <clears throat> oh, this is important. Um, the role that a variable plays in your research is not determined by that variable itself, but by your by your research design. Okay, what do I mean by this? Um, some variable, let's say unemployment, it can be a dependent variable in some context, but it can also be an independent variable in some context. Okay, and the role that the variable plays is determined by you, by your research design. 
Okay, having said that, let's look at some example. Let's say you find a, co a high correlation between um, smoking and cirrhosis, which is a, 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 a liver liver disease, and you could conclude that smoking induces cirrhosis, but of course, um, smoking does not have any effect on your liver, but we could um, hypothesize that um, smoking um, is has something to do with addictive behavior. Addictive behavior is has something to do with alcohol consumption and alcohol consumption of course um, has an effect on liver cirrhosis okay so this would be the actual causal chain but if um, we do not know about this stuff or we some forget to control for it then we could conclude that smoking induces cirrhosis okay be which is not true Second uh, example is the most famous one. Um, we observe a, a correlation between the number of storks in a region and the human birth rate. Um, one conclusion we could draw from this is that, well, storks actually bring babies. Um, but we, of course, this is not true. It is a spurious correlation, okay? There is some third factor, Z, which is correlated with both number of storks and the birth rate, okay? And of course, um, we could say this factor is um, uh, whether a region is rural or not, okay? If the region is rural, we have a lot of trees, um, uh, nice conditions for storks to breed, so we might have more storks, okay? And rural regions also have higher birth rates than city regions.